Now, a Channel 4 News primetime special, Dishonorable Conduct. General, will you please, please speak with me? Tonight, exposing military secrets. Obviously, the organization is infested with corruption. And criminal behavior inside one of the state's most revered organizations. They're finally understanding that this is really going on in the military. A series of Channel 4 I-Team investigations into men held to the highest of standards. I'm placed under arrest for driving on the influence of alcohol. Accused of tarnishing the reputation of the Tennessee National Guard. This female officer says that you sexually harassed her and then threatened her career. Prompting outrage from prosecutors. Someone sent me your story. I was surprised, probably a little bit angry. To the U.S. Congress. I've lost my patience on this one. Enough is enough. Here's Channel 4 anchor and chief investigative reporter Jeremy Finley. Good evening. What you will see in the next hour is proof, according to whistleblowers, of widespread corruption within the Tennessee National Guard. From how guardsmen are advancing through the ranks despite criminal behavior to reports of sexual misconduct that go all the way to the top of the Major General Staff. And our investigation into sexual misconduct began not in Tennessee, but in the Horn of Africa, where for the first time the I-Team exposed the criminal behavior of Tennessee National Guardsmen during a mission of mercy. They went to provide a vital resource. But what Tennessee soldiers did in a foreign land launched a U.S. Army criminal investigation into how Tennesseans ignored warnings about human trafficking and prostitution in the Horn of Africa and in the process placed sensitive classified materials in jeopardy. There need to be some consequences. The Channel 4 I team not only obtained the military investigation, but also photographs and other evidence into what members of the 775th Engineering Detachment did in both Djibouti, Africa, and in just across the border in Dair Dawa, Ethiopia. Criminal actions the public never knew about until now. The unit was sent to help dig water wells in and around Camp Lemonier in Djibouti and Dair Dawa. The military investigation shows the soldiers were given training by a captain in early July about, quote, that there was an issue with human trafficking in the area, how women end up stranded in Dair Dawa while trying to get to the Middle East. I told them not to engage in using prostitutes and that part of the mission is a positive projection of America. Moses Achonu is a native African and teaches African history at Vanderbilt. The poverty uh, makes people desperate in that region, and it is not uncommon sometimes to see underage girls, and sometimes even boys, try to eke out a living by you know, selling themselves. But both before and after that training, the military investigation found probable cause that nine of the 19 members of the unit had sex with prostitutes either at an off-base residence in Djibouti or committed sexual acts in exchange for money at the Samrat Hotel in Dair Dawa. To perpetrate that absolutely counters everything that we should be there uh, to do. When the soldiers were later interviewed, one sergeant made a spontaneous statement that several of the women referring to the prostitutes were younger than his daughter. The report blacked out the age of that soldier's daughter. How can you have a conscience and not speak up and try to do something? And photographs and drawings show why there was additional concern. A lieutenant says that senior leaders were taking prostitutes into a room where their weapons were stored. He goes on to say that the prostitutes were taken to a sergeant's room where a secure communication system was kept and also secret documents were stored. It's a cocktail of pressure but you expect professionally trained soldiers to be able to withstand that pressure and do the job for which they were sent there. While one of the soldiers did admit to paying for a prostitute, others asked for lawyers. Evidence was seized. The colonel said that some soldiers did not want to give up their phones. The colonel is quoted as believing the phones may contain evidence of criminal actions. Hearing all of this makes those who fight against human trafficking say the National Guard needs to explain what happened. If the military has the face that we do not want our soldiers to go in and buy sex, then there needs to be some consequences. 
And our investigations into what happened in the Horn of Africa revealed even more trouble and also raised questions if the punishment of these guardsmen fit the crime. They're photographs of what's believed to be a drug rampant in Africa, also now showing up in Middle Tennessee. And according to this military investigation, agents believe they also found the drug cat in an Ethiopian hotel room of a sergeant with the 775th Engineering Detachment from Jackson, Tennessee. As we've shown you, a unit where members were found to have had sex with prostitutes, even allowing some near classified information. You're essentially violating national security in some form or fashion. The Channel 4 I team showed the investigation to military law attorney James Phillips. It looked like they were going to these um, prostitutes, having sexual relations with them, and at the same time there was classified material around. That's a pretty big, uh, pretty big violation. But these documents labeled law enforcement sensitive found the military investigation had mixed results. First, the sergeant's room where the suspected cat was found was frequented by other people, so it's unclear whose it was. And the drugs were never analyzed because the investigative agent didn't want to risk transporting a known drug across international borders without approval from customs officials. So the sergeant was never punished. And even though in interviews, investigators found soldiers saying prostitutes were allowed in a sergeant's room with weapons and classified documents, investigators ultimately found the sergeant did not commit the offense of failure to obey an order of regulation when he allowed a known prostitute to enter the secure communications room. A large section of text following that statement is blacked out. What bothered me is that it did not look like the command addressed the level of severity that was part of these offenses. And even though military investigators found probable cause that nine soldiers had sex with prostitutes, a spokesman for the Tennessee National Guard said only seven were found to have, quote, received disciplinary measures ranging from letters of reprimand to reduction in rank and forfeiture of pay. We repeatedly asked the Tennessee National Guard for an interview, but they refused, saying all of our questions should go to the joint command in the Horn of Africa that ultimately oversaw the 775th detachment. But they too denied our request for an interview, only confirming that the soldiers were sent home early from their deployment and emailed a statement reading in part, the commander took decisive action and held the military members accountable for their actions. The conduct of the service members involved with this case was unacceptable and contrary to U.S. military values. What we also don't know is who the soldiers are. Their names are blacked out and the military refuses to release them, even though if someone is busted for soliciting prostitutes in the United States, it's public record. Philip suspects if this had happened at Fort Campbell, we'd have known about it. In the area that I work out of Fort Campbell, this would have been probably handled much more severely than the way they're doing it here. Coming up in our primetime special, a soldier's claims of rape exposes something the public's never known about until now. That's next. And welcome back. Over the years, rape and sexual assault in the military has been widely reported. But the Channel 4 I-Team's investigation into sexual misconduct in the Tennessee National Guard revealed something new, that even when soldiers are accused of rape and are never convicted or even charged, their victims are still trying to hold the military accountable for their suffering. Chief McAllister back here. It's the night of the Burn City Council meeting. I'm just looking for the chief. And newly appointed police chief Paul McAllister is scheduled to talk. Have you seen the police chief? But he's not out with the rest of the council and the citizens. He's standing in a room in the dark. Oh, Chief, I'm Jeremy Finley with Channel 4. He knows the Channel 4 I team is here to ask him some questions. What would you say to those allegations? Uh, they're all false, and I've released a statement to you, and that's all I have. Allegations made in a police report resulting in a line-of-duty investigation with the Army National Guard. Allegations that the new police chief of Burns raped a fellow soldier in 2007. When the Channel 4 I team learned of the allegations, we tracked down that soldier, and she is speaking out about something she never wanted to discuss publicly, only doing so because McAllister is now a police chief. It infuriates me. It worries me for other females. 
The soldier says back in 2007, she and McAllister had casual, consensual flings. She was a low-ranking soldier, he a sergeant in the Tennessee National Guard. She then started dating a new man, a man she would later marry. In this sworn statement to the National Guard and in this Dixon County detective's narrative, she says while on military duty, McAllister asked her to come to his house because he had something to give her. He came out and he was completely naked and I was like, oh my God, what are you doing? You know, I said, no, we're not doing this. In this sworn statement, she goes into graphic details of the alleged rape. According to the sworn statement to the military, the next day, she reported the incident to a superior. Basically told me there was nothing they could do, that um, I would either have to go to the civilian authorities or nothing because they couldn't do anything. She says she was so distraught by the lack of support from the military, she decided to move on. And try to pick up the pieces of my shattered life and my shattered military career and try to move on and, and go forth. She got married, went to serve in Iraq, and when she returned in 2009, she says her husband urged her to go to police. This Dixon County detective's narrative shows she met with police and District Attorney Ray Crouch. And Crouch tells the Channel 4i team he was willing to prosecute, but this soldier decided she'd had enough. And I said, no, thank you. I'll just, I'll just let it lie again and I'll, I'll forget about it again and try to move on with my life again. But when a local sexual assault response coordinator with the Army learned of the alleged incident, she encouraged the soldier to open a line of duty investigation. It only determines if a soldier was injured during the line of duty. In this case, it will determine if she was injured because of the alleged rape. She decided to wait it out in silence until she learned of McAllister's new job and was contacted about it by the Channel 4i team. I'm, I'm sitting here in just disbelief. I was just completely, I couldn't believe it. I still can't believe it. A statement released by McAllister's lawyer says, quote, he denies those allegations and has consistently denied those allegations. And this line of duty investigation is underway at the same time McAllister was named police chief. Do you think you should have disclosed to the city council about the allegations made in this military investigation? Uh, I've, I've released a statement to you, Jeremy. That's all I have. The city council knew about the allegations. Did you know about this military investigation until I brought it to you? No, I didn't. Councilman Ed Schottgrove and Councilman Chris Holland both tell the Channel 4i team they didn't know and wish they had. Should that have prevented him from being named police chief? I think so. It was then a waiting game for this soldier. Could she get benefits if her accused attacker was never charged? The answer came quickly. After our investigation aired, the military awarded the soldier benefits for PTSD secondary to sexual assault. They're finally understanding that this is really going on in the military. <laughs> Congressman Jim Cooper says after seeing our investigation, he decided to co-author legislation that would have taken the power to investigate sex assault claims away from military commanders and instead give the cases to independent military investigators. And when you have 26,000 reported cases of sexual assault a year in the military, they don't seem to be doing a very good job of handling it within the chain of command. If the motion is not agreed to. But the bill failed by five votes in the Senate after the Pentagon strongly came out against it. It is harder to hold someone accountable for failure to act if you reduce their power to act. But Cooper says they will continue lobbying senators to try to change their votes. But I've lost my patience on this one. Enough is enough. So, how many other female soldiers are trying to do what this soldier accomplished? Well, since that story, we've been filing open records requests for months to try to determine that. And just before this special, we received records of what we believe to be only a small amount of many other cases. But we found female soldiers in the National Guard in all of these cities across the world saying since 2010 they were raped in the line of duty and require benefits now. We're working on that investigation coming up in the new year. And we've got a lot of information right now on WSMV.com, including how we found a link between this soldier's rape case and a headline-making shooting on a military base in Memphis. You can find that story right now on WSMV.com. Coming up on this primetime special report.
this female officer says that you sexually harassed her. Our investigation shows reports of sexual misconduct reach all the way to the top staff of the Tennessee National Guard. And welcome back to our Dishonorable Conduct special report. So far, we've shown you cases of sexual misconduct in the rank and file, but our investigations also found a top colonel in the Guard accused of sexual harassment, and even after the military determined that it happened, denied him a promotion, and then he retired, he was then rehired with the Tennessee National Guard. She came to this National Guard Association conference in Nashville to learn from the best, but left with the worst of experiences. It weighs on me pretty heavily. It's a, it's a huge, bigger than just myself problem. What happened to this former Tennessee National Guard officer resulted in part in this U.S. Army Inspector General investigation, an investigation that led to a letter of reprimand for this top colonel and prevented him from being considered for a general position. But the Channel 4 I team has uncovered it didn't keep him from being hired back with the Tennessee National Guard. Obviously, the organization is infested with corruption. Fearing that identifying herself could harm her military career, she asked that we hide her face. She says she remembers being in a hospitality room at the conference and being told to go speak with the chief of staff with the Tennessee National Guard, Colonel William Wensler. Because he would be a good opportunity for professional development. She says the conversation between the two started off fine, but took an unexpected turn. Tell me I'm very beautiful, mentioning that his wife is in Afghanistan. He asked me to escort him back to his room. The IG's report shows when she refused, she was approached by him the next night. Made a very direct proposition. He said that, you know, he know I'd really like to f you. This is my room number. And I, I couldn't even respond. I was so shocked. And there were witnesses. Other people saw this. Yeah, there were. Although their names and ranks are blocked out in the report, the investigation shows another conference attendee testified that he and another attendee observed Colonel Wensler's and the officer's conversation and said, man, if I am not mistaken, because I heard the Colonel ask this young lady if she wanted to go upstairs and have sex. It was alarming that somebody, again, of his stature with that much power would think he was in a position to be able to do that and get away with it. This officer says when she went to two of her superiors and the Tennessee National Guard, along with a sexual assault response coordinator, their advice was the same. They advised me that if I was to move forward with turning this guy in, with a, filing a complaint, that it would have severely negative impacts on my career. But you ultimately did. I did. In the IG report, Wensler testified that the allegations were not true, but that he would write a statement to apologize for anything that he might have said that offended the officer. Investigators ultimately concluded that Wensler made inappropriate comments and references to the officer and wasn't truthful about what happened. That, along with other troubling findings in the report, resulted in a letter of reprimand by the Vice Chief of Staff with the U.S. Army. A spokesman for the Tennessee National Guard emailed and confirmed Wensler's name was removed from the general officer U.S. Senate nomination list. He then retired from military service. But look at the website for the Tennessee National Guard and you will see among the state staff and commanders William Wensler, because even after the inspector general's findings and the removal of his general consideration, Wensler was rehired as the director of administrative services for the Tennessee National Guard. That sounds like his boys covered for him. A spokesman for the Guard wrote, Wensler was interviewed and found to be the best applicant. His performance has been and continues to be outstanding. Colonel Wensler categorically denied and still denies all of the allegations contained in the IG report. While Wensler also denied our request for an interview, we still called and went to his home to try to get his side of the story. His wife answered the door. I did need to ask him about these sexual harassment allegations. Can you give him my card? And with that, she shut the door. The Channel 4 I team was determined to get responses from the lieutenant colonel and the general, and we got it, but only by tracking them down after their budget presentation to the governor.
<laughs> Retired Colonel William Wensler was more than happy to answer questions from the governor, but was in quite the hurry when the I-team had questions for him as well. This female officer says that you sexually harassed her and then threatened her career. What do you say to that? There isn't anything you want to say to that. I want to thank you for your interest in the military department, and I'd like to thank you guys for supporting the veterans. We've been trying to speak to Wensler about this, an inspector general's investigation that shows he was found to have failed to adhere to military values for inappropriate comments and references to this female officer, including when she told Wensler at a conference that she would walk away if he seriously offended her. He replied, you might not want to do that. That might be bad for your career. Following that encounter, she told military investigators he sexually propositioned her. He said that, you know, he know I'd really like to f you. This is my room number. I denied everything then. I'm denying it again now. I will not participate in a reinvestigation of something that was unfounded to start with. So are you saying that the military investigators were wrong then in their findings? Absolutely. And those military investigators also found more, that he improperly used government resources when he instructed that a female civilian subordinate receive a government Blackberry that was used for the two to have after hours conversations, a subordinate with whom he had an improper relationship. Do you think any of this should have precluded you from being rehired with the National Guard? So I'll refer that question to General Hastings, sir. General, I have some questions for you. So we tracked down the general after the budget hearing because during the Army investigation, Wensler was his chief of staff. Do you have any concern about what the military investigators found? I have concern about it. However, I will tell you is that having been through uh, numerous investigations, that investigation was very shallow. Colonel Wensler has uh, denied these allegations that's in there. Can you explain why Colonel Wensler was rehired despite the findings from the military investigation? Because he was absolutely the best man for the job. He has the background, has the experience, and has everything that that job needs and takes. It sends a bad message. But Brian Club questions Wensler's rehiring. He works for an association that helps women in the military who've been harassed or battered. When he was rehired, I think it's saying we don't care about sexual harassment um, and that if your rank is high enough, nothing's going to happen to you. Coming up, from sexual misconduct to other criminal behavior of guardsmen, what we expose next prompts outrage from an assistant district attorney and summons all of the recruiters in the state to a private meeting with the general. That's next. And welcome back to our primetime special, Dishonorable Conduct. If you were found to have violated state criminal codes from providing drugs without a prescription or driving under the influence, it could cost you your job. But our investigations found that isn't the case with the Tennessee National Guard. It's January 6th and Sergeant First Class Christian Castillo is preparing to celebrate. After all, his Facebook page shows he's proud to be a recruiting manager with the Tennessee National Guard. So it's no surprise he joined this celebration of who brought in the most new recruits. But it's what the Channel 4 I-Team uncovered that has some of his own fellow recruiters saying the upper ranks of the National Guard shouldn't have allowed him to even be in this position. He should get fired. These disciplinary records obtained by the I-Team show in October of 2012 an Army investigation substantiated that Castillo not only had an inappropriate relationship with the wife of one of his own fellow guardsmen, but that he violated a state criminal code by providing that woman Loritab pills that were prescribed to Castillo. It's against all values that the Army stands for. The I-Team also obtained this, showing Castillo was arrested a year earlier in Gallatin and charged with domestic assault. Police determined he was the primary aggressor, his wife saying he grabbed her around the neck. The clerk's office in Sumner County says there is no record of what happened in the domestic violence case. And do a TBI criminal background check on Castillo and nothing will come up. While the Army investigation, again, substantiated the crime, it is unclear if local prosecutors ever knew. Castillo's disciplinary records show he was simply reprimanded. His fellow recruiters say after these incidents, he was promoted. And this guy to get promoted ahead of his peers, far and above, that's wrong. 
and we have plenty of questions for the Tennessee National Guard about Castillo, including if law enforcement was ever told of the crime the National Guard substantiated. But they refused to do an interview. But a spokesman did send an email indicating the law reads they don't have to tell us what action they took. Quote, appropriate disciplinary measures pursuant to the severity of the infraction were taken by the command according to regulations and command policy. Records of such actions are protected by the Privacy Act of 1974. As for Castillo, he did not return our repeated calls for comment. I would not want my son or daughter talking to any recruiter from the National Guard at this point because they're allowed to get away with so much. And that case was only the beginning. What we found next showed the behavior of some recruiters that our whistleblowers thought should have cost them their positions, but instead they were promoted. You're seeing what Trooper Mark Miller saw on the evening of November 29th, 2013. When the truck crossed the divider lines, Miller turned on his lights to pull the truck over. He just ran into the guardrail. But after hitting that guardrail, the truck kept going. Only when Miller fired up his sirens did the truck finally stop. Step out with me right now. You hit that guardrail back there, you kept on going. In the driver's seat, Sergeant First Class James Rains, a recruiter with the Tennessee National Guard. Have you been drinking this evening? I can smell it on you. Rains tells the trooper he's only had one beer, but the sobriety test to lift his leg off the ground doesn't go so well. I can't do it. You can't do that? And neither does a request to say the alphabet. This is stupid. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, S, G. And neither does a request to count backwards from 57. 57, 54, 50, I can't do this. I'm placing you under arrest for driving under the influence of alcohol. That's unacceptable. Two of Reigns' fellow recruiters say while it's not good that Reigns was charged with DUI and ultimately pleaded down to a lesser charge, it's who else was in the truck that troubles them the most. Also inside, Master Sergeant David Cherry, another recruiter and a recruit, according to the trooper and other National Guard sources. It's unclear by the video, but one of the two passengers tells the trooper he's had one too many. Have you been drinking, sir? I'd like to call you six I don't think you're, you're safe to drive either. No, no I'm not going to drive. I'm four to out. Along with two three-fourths empty quart jars of apple pie untaxed liquor he had to pour out, the trooper found two empty 24 packs of beer, one and a half empty bottles of wild turkey, one and a half empty bottles of aftershock liquor, two empty Bud Light beer bottles still cold, and numerous empty bottles and cans of Bud Light. It meant two recruiters drove around in a vehicle filled with open alcohol with someone they wished to join the National Guard. Do you have two senior non-commissioned officers that have a recruit in their vehicle and they get pulled over, don't you think they should suffer? Instead, these recruiters say Reigns and Cherry were later promoted by the National Guard. They had a perfect opportunity of setting a new standard, say, hey, we're not going to tolerate this any longer and we're going to, uh, we're going to cut them. A spokesman for the Tennessee National Guard refused our request for an interview and also said federal law means they don't have to tell us how the men were punished, but wrote in an email, quote, the National Guard is a slice of society. Occasionally, just as in the civilian populace, we have soldiers and airmen who make questionable decisions or actions. When this happens, we take appropriate disciplinary measures pursuant to the severity of the infraction according to regulations and command policy. They should have looked at the charges and they should have immediately removed them from recruiting. Coming up, our investigations prompt the general of the Tennessee National Guard to summon all of his recruiters to a behind closed door meeting. What they didn't anticipate is that the I-team would find a way to hear what happened inside. That's next. And welcome back. Our investigations into criminal behavior by guardsmen and the Tennessee National Guard prompted the general to summon all of his recruiters in the state to a behind closed door meeting. We weren't allowed in, but we were still able to hear the scathing lecture the general had for his soldiers. General, that is Major General Terry Haston. This is a reporter who's requested an interview with him for months. 
General, hey, this is Jeremy Finley with Channel 4. You know, I've tried, sir, I've tried to schedule a few interviews with you. You can see he was more interested in leaving than answering questions. General, will you please, please speak with me? The general had come here to the Guard's Regional Training Center after summoning all of the recruiters in the state following a series of Channel 4 I-Team investigations. I need to ask you about why some of your own recruiters are questioning why National Guardsmen are being allowed to stay in the National Guard despite criminal backgrounds. And tonight, a source provided the Channel 4 I-Team the audio of what was said inside the meeting, a meeting where the general and his top staff gave a blistering lecture to the recruiters. I don't know how to say it other than this. Any instances of impropriety from 15 October on, I will be ruthless about enforcing. Does everybody understand that? Here's Sergeant Major Terry Scott talking about the dash cam video the Channel 4 I-Team exposed of two recruiters driving a recruit in a truck while drunk. There's some things that are going on that I don't like. When all this TV show and we're doing this and I saw the two drunks on TV and knew they were National Guardsmen, it embarrassed me as an NCO. It embarrassed me for the Tennessee National Guard. And when it was time for the general to address the recruiters, he didn't hold back. I cannot tolerate any more of this behavior. And y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. My tolerance level is zero. More than half of my behavior problems in Tennessee National Guard comes from my recruiting force. But the administration itself is also under fire from some of its own for allowing these men to stay in the Guard. General, are you going to answer any of my questions? While he had nothing to say to us, his message to his recruiters was clear. I'm not going to absolutely tolerate you dragging my organization down that I love. Even after that meeting, the Channel 4 I team continued to find guardsmen committing criminal behavior and allowed to stay and even advance in the guard. But we also uncovered a little known military secret that could explain how this is happening. In fatigues and in uniform, Lieutenant Colonel Stephen Jaco is every bit the high-ranking officer in the Tennessee National Guard. But there's another photo uncovered by the I-Team that puts him in another category, convicted criminal. Court records from Humphreys County show last year he was convicted of DUI and possession of a handgun under the influence. And then there's First Sergeant Julius Santini. Here's his mugshot from Davidson County. Court records show he was arrested and charged with a felony for theft of property over $10,000. Santini was never convicted. Instead, his case ultimately ended in what's called a retirement. Because he stayed out of trouble for a year, it's as if the charge never existed except for in court records. The question these whistleblowers with the Tennessee National Guard have, if military investigations or civilian courts or police have determined criminal activities or charges for these guardsmen, how are they still in the Guard? You're the face of the oldest military organization in the country. You should be above reproach. And the answer for how current guardsmen with troubled histories remain in their jobs may be in this enlistment manual. It shows that waivers can be granted. Take, for instance, in Jaco's case, his two convictions require a waiver. We spoke by phone with Jaco's attorney. Someone who has been convicted of a DUI in possession of a handgun, is that the kind of person that should remain in the National Guard? He has been convicted, but is on appeal. And yeah, I believe we have issues that the Court of Appeals will look at favorably in this instance. I think ultimately the conviction will be overturned. As for Santini... You've reached First Sergeant Julius Santini. We left him a message, but we're still waiting to hear back. But the whistleblowers say there's also another element to all this, at least when it comes to recruiters with troubled backgrounds. Ladies and gentlemen, y'all got to police yourselves. That's the general of the Tennessee National Guard chastising his top recruiters in a behind-closed-door meeting. And when the I-Team obtained that audio, we heard something these whistleblowers had mentioned before about the pressure to increase the numbers in the ranks of the Guard. There's even an insider term for it. Contracts cure cancer. This whistleblower says it means if recruiters bring in enough new members or contracts, then the recruiter's bad behavior is overlooked. If I put a whole bunch of people in the Guard, I can do whatever I want, and I'm not going to be held accountable. 
So it's all about bringing in new members. It's all about the numbers. Now listen to what was said in the meeting about the need to bring in new recruits. We're lagging behind what we've done in previous years. We're about 8 to 10 percent lower than everybody else in the nation. We still haven't broken the code as to why. Coming up, what we expose next prompts outrage from an assistant district attorney. Someone sent me your story. I was surprised, probably a little bit angry. That's next. And welcome back. The findings from our investigations then prompted an assistant district attorney to write the governor and the major general, asking, how is it that a guardsman I successfully prosecuted is still in your organization? It's an admission Lieutenant Colonel Stephen Jaco makes not once. Had been drinking? Yes, sir. Not twice. I think I was wrong drinking before I got there. But three times. Yes, I had been drinking. Actually make that four times. I didn't stay there long enough to sober up because I was pissed off. And he also admits in this DUI video obtained by the I-Team about the loaded gun in his truck. Having a loaded weapon, that's definitely. At his trial, he was convicted of DUI and possession of a handgun while intoxicated. His request for a second trial denied. And a Channel 4 I-Team investigation in April exposed how four years after being arrested, Jaco is still with the Tennessee National Guard at the same rank. Someone sent me your story. The prosecutor who convicted Jaco admits he was taken aback. I was surprised, probably a little bit angry. Assistant District Attorney Jack Arnold then wrote this letter to Governor Haslam and Major General Terry Haston. And after detailing some specifics of Jaco's case, including that his blood alcohol level was nearly twice the legal limit, he wrote, It came to my attention that Jaco is still an active duty member of the Guard. Frankly, I cannot get my head around this. I was surprised that he was still in the Tennessee National Guard and still at his rank. A veteran of the U.S. Army himself, Arnold says he's seen what happens to members of the Army if they're convicted of the same offenses. Have lost their military position in the active duty military as a result of that kind of charge. So I was surprised. What remains to be seen is if this enlistment program obtained by the I-Team shows why Jaco and all the other guardsmen the I-Team found with criminal pass remain with the guard. It shows some offenses can be granted waivers. Ten months ago, the I-Team filed a Freedom of Information Act request, requesting all of the Tennessee National Guard members awaiting waivers to criminal charges. We are still waiting on those records. As for hearing from the governor or the major about the letter he wrote five months ago. Have you ever heard anything from the governor or from the National Guard? Nope. Did you expect to? Yeah. No one from the Tennessee National Guard responded to our request for comment, and the governor's office only released a statement saying that this guardsman is not a state employee. We asked for clarification as to what that meant, and they said their statement is final. Coming up, what may be the most troubling development yet. A suspected whistleblower says he's the target of a Molotov cocktail. That's next. And welcome back. Just one hour after one of our investigations aired on television this year, a member of the Tennessee National Guard, suspected of being a whistleblower, says someone tried to firebomb his home. 911, what's the exact location of your emergency? The 911 call came on February 23rd. Have you been drinking this evening? I can smell it on you. Not long after the Channel 4 I team broadcast this investigation, exposing how a National Guard recruiter failed a sobriety test. Out. After driving a truck filled with open alcohol and carrying a recruit and another recruiter inside. The story featured whistleblowers criticizing the Tennessee National Guard for later promoting the men involved. This police report says an hour after that story aired, a National Guardsman heard something hit his door. According to the officer who responded, he could smell a strong odor of accelerant, associating the smell with gas. The officer found a mason jar with gasoline inside and a hole punched out and wrote, Due to my training and experience, I believe the mason jar was fashioned to function as a Molotov cocktail. Did you know the person that did this? No, sir. 
The guardsman did tell police that Channel 4 had aired stories regarding misconduct at his work and that several of his co-workers believed he was one of the whistleblowers. The officer then wrote he spoke with state bomb and arson investigators and called it possible retaliation for the whistleblower stories. Detectives later examined the area and found what they thought to be human footprints but they were unable to find a possible ignition source. I asked General Terry Haston about it following his budget hearing last month. Do you have any comment at all about a gentleman who the guard suspects may have been a whistleblower had a jar of gas thrown at his house? No, I don't. You need to go talk to the local uh, uh, law enforcement about that because I don't have anything, I don't know anything about that. There is concern about retaliation for that. Are you concerned about no, that? No, I'm not, not at all. But 911 dispatch certainly did have concern when the call came in. I'm going to have officers en route to you just momentarily. We will continue to press for answers to what happened in this case and all of the others. We have many Freedom of Information Act requests pending, and we intend to hold the Tennessee National Guard accountable for anything we find. Thanks for watching. For all of us here on the Channel 4i team, good night.